Hey there, everyone. We're so fortunate to have this time with John Smart. John wrote Sooner, Safer, Happier. And I think you're going to find that the insights that he's gathered in the book based on years of experience are going to be really relevant to what you're doing. So uh, I'm just going to keep the introduction short so we can hear from John. John, if you would just tell us why you wrote the book, a little bit about your background in getting to the book, and we'll take it from there. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I've been an agile and lean practitioner since the early 1990s um, when it was called lightweight processes and there were lightweight processes and heavyweight processes. Um, and so most of my career has been helping teams go on the journey from traditional ways of working to more agile and lean ways of working. Um, my, in my previous role, I was leading ways of working across Barclays Bank globally, across 80,000 people. And, um, you know, we, 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 made, we made some mistakes, we learned the hard way. And so what I wanted to do with the book is to share our learnings, the mistakes that we've made so that other people don't have to make the same mistakes that we made. And also within this book, it's not only our learnings, but there's learnings from about 100 companies in here as well. Um, and this is, you know, this is, as you know, a very hot topic. Um, pretty much every organization is on this journey trying to increase their agility. So the idea is this is a bit of a, um, a, a help, a guide, a help for organizations. The book is written for leaders at all levels in all roles. So it's not only for IT. It's as much aimed for someone in marketing or finance or procurement and the leaders at all levels, um, everybody is a leader, you know, so it's 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 got a, a very deliberately a, a fairly broad audience in mind, people who are working in traditional firms. Yeah, that's really timely. I was speaking yesterday with one of our customers and he said one of the greatest things for their dev team was realizing that because of the cadence that they were taking on for how they were rolling out changes and how they were innovating, it was actually forcing the rest of the organization to adopt the same mindset. So instead of planning for months and months that we're gonna change some organizational thing or change some policy, the other teams are saying, wow, we gotta be in this sort of think about it, make a change, see what happened loop. So that exactly what you're speaking to. And I think leaders at all levels is also great. This is not, this is not a boardroom book. You know, this isn't for the C-level people to figure out how they're gonna force a top-down change. This is actually for anybody who cares about a better way of working. So speaking of way of working, I thought we ought to spend just a minute and clarify terms, right? So before I read your book, I hadn't actually hadn't encountered the phrase ways of working, right? And I think that ways of working and the Kinevin framework um, and sort of distinguishing agile from lean um, would be a good next spot for us to kind of ground people on where we're going. Mm, yeah. So, so ways of working, I, I like to use that language because it isn't just about agile. It isn't just about lean. It isn't just about digital or DevOps or cloud. Those are all the means to an end. They aren't the end. You know, it's not agile for agile's sake or cloud for cloud's sake or digital for digital's sake and so on. Ways of working, I like that expression because, because it's about adopting better ways of working which lead to better outcomes. And better ways of working might include agile ways of working or might not. It might be lean, more lean ways of working. It might be, um, in some cases, because of a history and because of baggage from previous failed capital A, agile, capital T transformations, which have been inflicted in the past. Actually, the best approach is smaller waterfalls. And yeah, honor your current roles and responsibilities, pursue evolutionary improvement. And actually, it's not about agile at all because there's a, you know, there's a negative reaction to that word based on what's happened in the past for some organizations. Um, and, and so this is where you know, sensing the, the domain of work you're in is very important. If the domain of work you're in is unique and unknowable and you've never done it before, um, and this, there's, a, there's a sense-making framework called Kinevin by Dave Snowden, which is a very useful, useful point of reference, which Dave is holding up right now. Um, if you are, if your work is emergent, you've never done it before. There are unknown unknowns. That's complex, a complex domain, and that is the sweet spot for agile, because you need a fast feedback loop. You need fast time to learning because you've never done it before. You want variability. You want experimentation. Um, 
The domain across over onto the right at the top is um, uh, complicated, which is repetitive activity. You've done it before, you've done it a thousand times before, you know exactly what you're doing. So there the sweet spot is lean and lean comes from the, the Toyota production system, which is exactly about mass production. It's mass producing Toyotas, mass producing cars. So interestingly, um, we, you know, work doesn't stay in one place. Work moves around the domains. So something, a new product is agile created, and then it's mass produced, goes into lean, a shallow dip into chaos, something goes wrong, agile created again, and back into lean again. Software in particular is an interesting case because software is not just one or the other. Software is both agile and lean. The binary is agile created. You, create, you don't write the same software a million times. That would be stupid. You write it once, you realize how you could have written it better, you refactor it, and then you run it a million times. So agile is, um, the, the binary is your agile created box. And the path to production, your DevOps pipeline, your, your build, test, run, path to production, that is lean because you do run that. You should be running that many times a day, you know, ideally every commit, you're, you're running your, your build pipeline. And you pipeline. should work it out. You should have exactly. that pretty well worked out. You should have that pretty well worked out. And um, right. so automation, test automation, security testing automation. Um, so that is lean. Uh, so basically it's an agile created box on a lean conveyor belt. Um, and then every now and then you might have a um, significant innovation. You know, you might do some significant refactoring in your environment, your build environment. So then you might have a little bit of agile creation in your path to production, and then it's lean again. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay, so so uh, the book is titled Sooner, Safer, Happier, but you propose a framework which is better value, sooner, safer, happier, or hashtag BVSSH, right? So let's let's just briefly cover what each of the letters does or what it, what it means in the context, and then and then I think we'll probably want to drill into the sooner, but let's, let's mm. see if we can do the whole thing and then we'll, we'll circle back and drill into sooner. Sure. So, so better is quality. And this is about building quality in, not inspecting it in later, not pass, knowingly passing a quality issue down the line. To quote W. Edwards Deming, um, it, it, um, inspecting quality in later is like saying, I'll burn the toast and you scrape. Tell you what, don't burn the toast in the first place. So that's better. Um, value is unique. It's why you're in business. It could be mortgages, jet engines, fashion retailer, luxury bags. So value is entirely unique and it's why you're in business and it's measured through, I like to measure it through OKRs where KR, key result, is your leading and lagging value measures. The next one, sooner, is the heart of agile, the heart of lean. It's time to learning. It's time to value, time to be able to pivot. Safer is compliance, that is infosec, data privacy, uh, fraud, bribery, anti-money laundering, that's all of your mandatory uh, risk stories so that you, you don't leak customer data onto the internet and get a very large fine like some companies. And happier is happier colleagues, customers, citizens, and climate because improving ways of working is not at any cost to the planet or to society. Awesome, so if we go back into Sooner, I'm really, I think the audience would benefit from sort of Let's talk about flow efficiency, lead time. I think I think a number of us know that reducing lead time is is desirable. And when I explain this often to people, I'll say, you know, if I'm a developer, um, I don't want to go from here. I have an idea to wow, I get to see whether it worked three weeks from now, or six months from now, or even frankly three days from now. If I've got some idea, the faster I can get feedback, um, both from running into production and from actual customers seeing it, the better, right? So. Let's talk a bit because of what you found in terms of the typical flow efficiency is pretty scary. Yeah. So what the th three measures I like within Sooner, the first one is lead time. And, and as you said, that's time from committing to a piece of work uh, to getting it into the hands of the, of the consumer. And I, I prefer to use the word consumer because it's not necessarily a customer. The consumer could be internal to your organization or could be external to your organization. So there's a value producer and a value consumer. Lead time, it's not a cycle time. It's not a dev done, test done. It's genuinely the point that we start working on something so it's in the hands of the person it's intended for. 
That's your lead time. Now, obviously, you want to reduce your lead time because that is all about time to learning. You want to minimize your time to learning because then you can have genuine agility. You can pivot. Learn, pivot, learn, pivot. So that's the first one, lead time. The second one is throughput. Uh, Little's law, as you reduce your lead time, your throughput will go up. Your throughput is the count of number of items of value that you are producing. Now, my advice here, to avoid being a feature factory, your throughput should not go up by the same amount that your lead time comes down. Because if you if you just have, if you like halve your lead time and double your throughput, you're just becoming a feature factory. And doing the wrong thing faster makes you wronger. I mean, you know, bad grammar. Um, but doing the, you know, the, it's not about it's velocity. Point well made though, yes, right. It's not about velocity. So, you know, it's not about, it's not about velocity. This is why it's not the word faster. That's why it's the word sooner, not faster. Sooner time to learning. Um, and then flow efficiency, which I believe is very important, one of the most important, which is the amount of time that work is being worked on versus work is waiting. Most large companies, work is waiting 90% of the time. And it's hidden in most companies. Most companies are not measuring it. They don't know that. And I think that's a, a really um, kind of shocking um, uh, norm, you know, that, that knowledge work is only being worked on 10% of the time. And that's typically because organizations are trying to do two parallel. They're not limiting work in progress because there are 26 governance committees. There are role-based silo handoffs. And so work just sits in queues. You know, there's an annual funding process. You know, there's... Right. The committees. So work just sits in queues. So the trick there is to focus where the work isn't. Impediments are not in the path. Impediments are the path. Focus where the work isn't. What is leading to work waiting? Alleviate those impediments and then repeat. Yeah, this relates to local optimization because each of those touches may say, well, I got it on Thursday and I had it turned around in 25 minutes. But, mm -hmm. you know, if that means it's going to sit in a queue where somebody's not going to get it on their desk for four more days, then then they're going to say, well, I touched it in two hours. Like, like, no, we actually, and I think this gets back to autonomy and, and local control because inherently when you hand off, you've got cues, right? And when you mm -hmm. are, uh, when you are a self-contained team, you are, you run at your own cadence, right? So yeah. let, let's talk about dependencies and linkage. And, and, and I, I think an architecture is closely related, right? You know, We've both been at this for a little while. It used to be that inter enterprise architecture was this holy grail that by investing in, in these standardizations of data schema or, or enterprise integration bus or something, we were somehow going to, we'd have these superpowers and we'd go faster because we'd have these great things we've invested in. And then reality is that when you force the entire organization to be doing the exact, you know, working from the same thing, you, you cause more of this kind of, uh, Stuff doesn't move. So, so let's talk about that flow and dependencies. And like, you make a good point about should we manage dependencies or not? Yeah. So, lesson learned the hard way. Um, you know, a few, a few, years, quite a few years back, we spent a lot of time just managing the dependencies, just visualizing them and managing them. And then, and then I realized, oh, how stupid have we been? We've been putting all of this effort into visualizing and managing dependencies, but we haven't been putting effort into breaking them. And it's like, oh God, how that was a mistake. So that that was a big lesson learned, which is prioritize breaking impediments over managing them. You've got to break the impediments because that's how back to this kind of flow efficiency, impediments are not in the path, impediments are the path. If you're not breaking impediment, if you're not breaking dependencies, be they architectural or any other form of, of dependency, maybe between teams, for example as well as architectural. If you're not breaking those dependencies, um, then you're not going to get a, far, a quicker lead time. Yeah, and I think that's one of the superpowers of feature flags, kind of what we do, right, is that you can you can decouple deployment from release, and so you can actually commit your code, even though it's not even done yet, or it's not ready for the consumer, and it can actually flow through the pipeline, uh, rather than you saying, well, we have to make sure that all the stars are aligned before we all commit or deploy our stuff. And, and so you get a situation where people can touch move on, do the next thing, right? We have probably about 10 seconds left. I think I want to once again suggest that people take some time, carve out some time to read the book. Inside the cover, there is a great sort of key for what's the best way to get value from the book itself. 
depending on your role or your, your objectives. I want to thank you, John, for joining us. It's been a great, great chance to chat.